Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 37th meeting in 2017 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Could I please remind everyone present to make sure that their mobile phones are on silent? The first item on the agenda is a decision in taking... T Sorry, is this sound quite right? It sounds awfully echoey to me. Sorry? He's agreeing it does. Okay. So I will push on. It's the, the first item is a decision on taking business in private. The committee has asked to consider taking item four relating to the draft budget scrutiny 2018 in private today and the report on the draft budget islands bill in private at future meetings. Are all members agreed? agreed. We are agreed. So we'll move on to agenda item two which is the committee will now take evidence from the Scottish Government on the draft budget 2018-19. I'm going to invite members to declare any interest relevance to this item relating to farming and transport. And I'm going to kick it off by saying that I am a member of a farming partnership and it is disclosed on my register of interest. Uh, Peter. Uh, like Roy, uh, convener, I would declare an interest as a uh, uh, partner in the farming business in uh, Aberdeenshire. Thank you. Uh, John. Yeah, uh, I'm a member of the RFP parliamentary group. Thank you. And the cross party group in Wales, indeed. Thank you. Stuart. Uh, I have a small <coughs> registered agricultural <coughs> holding and I am uh, Honorary President of the Scottish Association of Passenger Transport and Honorary Vice President of Rail Future UK. Thank you. Rhoda. Um, I'm Honorary Vice President of Friends of the Far North Line and a member of several cross party groups. Too many to mention, I think. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Gail. Um, I am also uh, Honorary Vice President of Friends of the Far North Line. Okay, I'm sorry to... Could I ask Is you just to repeat that, just in case it wasn't recorded? Um, I am also Honorary Vice President of Friends of the Far North Line. Thank you. I think um, I'd rather get this sorted out before we go into this important uh, session, so I'm going to suspend the meeting briefly while we sort out the sound and system. So the meeting is now suspended.
Hello, this is uh, Joe speaking. Can you hear me? Right, okay. What would appear to be the problem? Where's Matt gone to? He's not here. Right, okay. Uh, yeah. One, two, one, two. Sounds reasonably okay. One, two, one, two, one, two. Okay, I'll leave you with it in a moment. I'll see if I can find Matt. Right, thank you. I, I'm now going to reconvene the meeting, although there are some problems with the sound. We are going to work through it. Now, could I just also remind everyone uh, that this is uh, the, I'm trying to remember there, the uh, uh, Rural Econo 37th meeting of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Now, we got through item uh, one and we were moving on to item two. And we're now going to take evidence from the Scottish Government on the draft budget for 2018 and 19. We have declared interest. I'd like to welcome from the Scottish Government, Fergus Ewing, the Cabinet Secretary for the Rural Economy and Connectivity, <laughs> Hamza Youssef, the Minister of Transport and the Islands, Lee Shedden, the Financial Controller at Transport Scotland, George Burgess, the Deputy Director of Food and Drink and Trade, Robbie McGee, the Head of Digital Connectivity Policy, and Annabel Turpey, the Chief Operating Officer for the Rural Payments. Now, Cabinet Secretary, I, I am happy to give you an opening statement, but as we have lost uh, 16 minutes into this meeting and there are a considerable amount of questions, please could I ask you to ensure that your opening statement is no more than four minutes, shorter if possible. Cabinet Secretary. Well, in the interest as always of being helpful, I have uh, truncated the the uh, script here, in fact, I've taken a, a calligraphic machete to it, you'll be pleased to hear, so it's foreshortened. Um, convener, our, our overarching aim is to grow the rural economy and to support wider connectivity through an integrated approach to inclusive economic growth, and we will do this by a large number of measures. Delivering of a reformed CAP, enabling all to access super-fast broadband by 221, enabling and encouraging sustainable development enterprise and investment in the rural economy, building on success in our world-class food, drink and forestry sectors, repopulating and empowering rural, coastal and island communities, investing in low carbon transport, promoting active travel, providing vital transport links, uh, delivering better journey times, reducing emissions uh, and uh, providing greater quality and accessibility and affordability in our public transport. This is all against the backdrop of a 2% reduction in the 2.8 billion REC portfolio budget uh, of £60 million. I would highlight three areas I believe the committee may be interested in. First, food and drink. We will continue to support the growth of our industry through funding for <coughs> delivery of Ambition at 230. In digital connectivity, I'm delighted to uh, reconfirm the announcement that the Scottish Government will invest uh, £600 million to extend superfast broadband band access to every home and business across Scotland by the end of 2021. I covered this yesterday, so I, I have eliminated the vast swathes of text on that. Uh, on physical connectivity, we will uh, improve journey times, connections, cut emissions, improve quality, accessibility and affordability and double the investment in active travel to £80 million uh, a year. We've increased the budget for bus services and concessionary fares from 254 to 269 million and this includes 10 million of new funding for loans to tackle bus fleet emissions to improve air quality, maintaining the budget to support bus services and encouraging green buses and continue our commitment to free bus travel. Uh, we'll invest in the maintenance and operation of Scotland's trunk roads and motorways to maintain the safety and serviceability of the network. Uh, we are committed to a large number of major infrastructure projects. Again, I've eliminated the detail here and perhaps 
uh, uh, my colleague Mr Yusuf can touch on that if, if asked in questions. Uh, safe to say that I'm very pleased that this year we will continue the design and development work on duelling the A9 and A96 and commence construction of duelling the A9 from Lunkerty to Burnham. <clears throat> we'll continue to support ferry services on Clyde and Hebrides, Gurick to Danoon and Northern Isles routes, protect the RET on the Clyde and Hebrides ferry service and reduce passenger and car fares on ferry services to Orkney and Shetland. We'll continue our significant investment in railways again. I will spare the details in the interest of time. Well short of four minutes, convener, I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. And just to remind people that uh, the committee has conducted some pre-publication budget scrutiny on the food and drink sector. So we'll be following up that work with questions to you, Cabinet Secretary. And we'll also be discussing other areas within the budget, which is the EU support and related services, rural services, forestry commission, digital connectivity, and of course, transport. And I'm very grateful for uh, the minister for agreeing to forgo his opening statement uh, to allow us to move straight on to questions. So the first question uh, today is from Mike Rumbles. Thank you very much, Convener. It's an overarching question, really. Having gone through the Scottish Budget Draft Budget 2018-19 document on page 186 uh, under the heading Annex B Portfolio Spending Plans. On table two, I'm looking at total manager expenditure. Uh, in that, what puzzles me on this, this document is that of all of the departments of government, from health, finance, education, justice, economy, running them, them all, the only department, according to this table, that suffers a decrease in actual spend, according to the table, is the Rural Economy and Connectivity Department. And I was wondering whether you could explain why it is the only department that is suffering a cash loss, according to this um, table on page 186 of the draft budget. So is, I thought this question was going to be about food and drink, but it sort of veered off that. Is this question about the rural budget as opposed to... I didn't understand question the question. Question on actually. the budget, Cabinet Secretary. The, the questions will come in, 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 in a variety of orders. So if you could answer that first question, well, Cabinet Secretary. Actually is, is the question, uh, and I, I genuinely don't understand the question, but is well, the I'm question to, to say why the rural budget is, according to Mr. Rumble, has been treated differently from other directorates, mm -hmm. such as education and employment and so on? Well, I, I or just. Not? I don't know. Well, I've spent the weekend since receiving this document having a look right through it. I assume all the ministers have poured over this as well, and I would hope if you, if you haven't got it in front of you, I'm trying to help. It's on page 186, it's Annex B, it's the portfolio spending plans of all the government departments in this table, and the only, the only department, according to this table, on page 186, that has a reduction from last year of 2,866 million to 2,806 million, a reduction of 60 million, is the rural economy and connected. It's a genuine question. I, well, um, okay. Uh, if I can answer it this way, I mean, as I said in the opening, truncated opening statement, uh, our budget has had a reduction of 2% overall. The treatment of other directorates is a matter for Mr Mackay. I'm responsible for my portfolio yeah, yes, budget, but, and I'm but, here to answer questions but, about that. Yes, I'm asking a question about that. I'm just asking, obviously... This is a discussion amongst cabinet ministers for their departments, but the only department that has suffered a cut is this department. And I was wondering if you could explain, in relative to other departments, why that should be the case. Well, these are questions for Mr Mackay. I'm here to answer about the REC budget, and I will do that. Uh, Rumbles, I don't think you're going to get more no, of an answer not, to I'm that. Not, I mean, the I'm cabinet not. secretary, uh, you, you will have seen, I'm sure, the spice briefing, which, which, which highlights that. And, Maybe uh, we, we, we can leave it there and, and move on to the second mm. question. I'm sorry, Mr. Rumbles, I don't think you're going to get an answer there. I'm second sure question is, yeah. is Peter Chapman. Thank you, convener, and uh, welcome uh, to, the, to the panel. Um, my question is about the overall food and drink budget. You know, we have a bold ambition to grow, to double the value of Scotland's food and drink to, tw by, to 30 billion by 2030, which is only 12 years away. So it's a very ambitious target, which I absolutely support. But this does mean that year-on-year -year growth of 5% of, of is, is necessary to achieve that. And, and you know, we, it is, as I say, is it realistic? Is it, it's, it is certainly ambitious. 
And uh, James Withers, uh, the CEO of Scotland Food and Drink, said it would be helpful to have greater clarity about the areas of funding and the scale of investment. So my first question is, does the Cabinet Secretary have a clear view of the strategic direction of the spending priorities to support Ambition 2030? Well, yes, yes we do. Uh, and our strategic vision is that we work with the private sector in order to achieve the high aspirations, as Mr Chapman has said, that's set out in Ambition uh, 230. Of course, most of the growth will result from private sector investment. Mm -hmm. I mean, the tremendous success of our food and drink sector, for example, our whiskey, our gin, uh, our salmon, our, our potatoes, our soft fruit, uh, our sea fish, our shellfish. In all of these sectors, you have entrepreneurial businesses that, in most part, uh, create their own growth. In some occasions, helped, of course, by, by the public sector. Uh, but that success will largely be delivered by the private sector with the public sector providing support. Uh, and our role is to focus on the areas where public money and the use of public money convener can provide added value. Um, now, I, I can think of five or six different ways where I can um, give excellent examples of how the use of taxpayers' money invested uh, uh, in the food and drink sector is already producing extra value. But I think the main answer to the question is how will this ambitious target be delivered? Largely by the, the remarkable success of our food and drink sector and individual businesses and people within it and increasingly related to the tourism sector as well. Mm. I thank the Minister, uh, Government Secretary for that report. But, I, I, you know, I, I go back to the, the, the quote from James Withers. And, you know, it, it, he said it, it would be helpful to have greater clarity about the areas of funding and the scale of investment. You know, the, the investment comes under various headings. And it is, it is somewhat of a minefield for, for, various, for the companies to find the, the best way forward to, get, to gain that support, to grow the business, to, to achieve the ambitious target. It's, can the, can the Cabinet Secretary comment on that, the fact that it seems to be a fairly tortuous process to, to find your way through the various support schemes? Could it, could it be made simpler? Well, it's inherently complex, but I don't see it as a, a minefield. Uh, rather, I see it as a successful partnership of the Scottish Government and the Scotland Food and Drink and individual companies working together. I mean, uh, I think uh, if we give some examples, I mean, some of the public money is used in marketing uh, of Connect Local, marketing through SDI, who have 11 in-market specialists uh, <clears throat> who are working in locations throughout the world, from, from California through to Singapore and Japan. Uh, and these uh, 11, 11 people are estimated as between 17 and 20, uh, working with others to deliver an extra 50 million 50 million growth in exports uh, from the efforts of 11 individuals whom I met recently. Uh, you know, they've sold oat cakes to California, uh, for example. Uh, they've sold cheese to France, not something that we would have thought as, as too likely, given France's preeminence in uh, the production of high-quality cheeses. That's okay. uh, and therefore, Scottish businesses are succeeding all over the, all over the globe. Uh, and we have invested in 11 individuals, uh, basically super salespeople, to promote Scottish produce all over the world. Getting cheese into American supermarkets. Uh, the, the, this has been a, a, a great example of, uh, uh, of spending to accumulate uh, a very successful one. Another one, convener, is uh, showcasing Scotland, an event which took place just in Glen Eagles just a couple of months back and which is, a, uh, I think it's a biennial event. Uh, the, this brings together buyers from around the world with two Scottish-based companies. And the one I attended recently saw 100 buyers from 17 key markets meeting 150 of our suppliers. There was over 3,000 speed dating sessions between the Scottish companies and the international buyers. I spoke to about 20 or 30 of these buyers at a reception at Glen Eagles. They were all bowled over by the high quality of Scottish produce. The clean, pure atmosphere and water was a big selling point compared to other parts of the globe. The provenance of our 
food and drink uh, was a huge selling point. The benefits from the event two years ago, and this is just one event in one hotel, was 33 million. The benefits this year are estimated to be 50 million. Now, I've just given two examples. I could go on to talk about procurement, the Food for Life program in schools. Recently, I visited East Ayrshire, uh, and the amount of uh, money that they spend locally procuring food from local farmers, such as Mr. Chapman, except in Ayrshire, uh, has been superb, supplying high-quality, nutritious, locally produced food to their pupils. Eleven local authorities participate in that. We're investing to get the other 21 local authorities to do so as well. Uh, and overall, the food procurement has gone uh, in Scotland, uh, in the public sector, from 39 to 48% over the past 10 years. So I'll just give a few quick examples, but um, across the piece, uh, we work very closely with Scotland Food and Drink. In fact, I see James Withers more than uh, many of the members of my own family. And, uh, you know, we couldn't work more closely and effectively. So I don't think it's a, it's a minefield. It's a, it's an ocean uh, and a world of opportunity that Scottish businesses are grasping with our help. Just one final uh, point. Uh, uh, Sorry, can I just say, uh, th I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that very full answer that he's given. I mean, we are very pushed for time in, in this session, and, and we've lost time at the beginning. That, to me, was quite a long answer, well, Cabinet good Secretary. Well, good examples, though. Ca Cabinet Secretary, with, with the greatest respect, uh, I'm here to uh, when I'm talking, if you could let me conclude, I, I would appreciate it. It was a very long answer. I would ask you, please, to keep the answers as short as possible. Peter Chapman, a follow-up question. Just a short one. Uh, I just wonder if it could and should more of the money actually be channeled through Scotland Food and Drink. Is that, is that a, a way forward? Well, uh, we, we already are in partnership with Scotland Food and Drink, and I think the, the plans that we have strike a, strike a good balance. Uh, the next question is from Gail Ross. Good morning, panel. Um, Cabinet Secretary, you've, you've outlined um, really quite succinctly how the Scottish Government works with all these different companies to promote the food and drink sector. Um, but the, the Scottish Fiscal Commission are forecasting um, economic growth to be less than 1% going forward. And as Peter Chapman mentioned already, um, if we're to get to um, 2030 um, with the, the very ambitious plans that we have, um, we would need to see a growth rate of around 5% per annum. Do you think that the funding that the Scottish Government is providing is enough to achieve that? Um, well, I, I think we are, we are playing our part with the resources that we have in a tight budget settlement. <laughs> but I would also say that uh, you know, we are seeing remarkable progress in forestry in the, uh, towards meeting our targets of, uh, of planting 10,000 hectares per annum. We are close to achieving our targets fairly soon on that, and the rate of increase is way over 5%. Uh, I'm just back from the fishing negotiations. Uh, the figures from memory, convener, of the value of the quotas, the total quotas for the fishing fleets were around 400 million. We gained about a 44 million increase in that. That's 10%, isn't it? Uh, in our farming sector, I'm struck by the entrepreneurship of farmers the success and efficiency of co-ops and SOS, working with them to support them, the drive, particularly of you know, the, the new blood, like Mr Chapman's son, if I may say so, recently won a distinguished award in, uh, in Agri-Scott, and good, good luck to him. But there's a whole cohort of, of new generation of farmers who are doing extremely well, taking advantage of opportunities, using new technology, uh, farming in a more green fashion, and able to achieve growth at more than 5%. So it's primarily the businesses in the sectors that will drive the growth, not the government. The government is there to, to oil the wheels, to provide support, to provide EMF funding for our ports and harbours, to provide food and marketing grants. And all of these are predicated on the continuance of the funding that we've come to expect from the CAP. So the big question mark really, again, is, is Brexit and whether that funding will be available to Scotland, and in particular rural and island Scotland, which has been perhaps the, the main beneficiaries in areas like Elfast, where I was delighted to uh, be able to maintain the support at the existing 100% level rather than the 80% cut. Okay. Um, yeah. okay, the next question is from John Mason. 
Uh, thanks, Convener. And uh, Cabinet Secretary used the phrase there, oil the wheels. And um, when we spoke to some of the witnesses from the food and drink sector, they were talking about transport and the importance of being able to move uh, their very high quality products uh, around. Now, the Cabinet Secretary also mentioned the A9 and the A96, which are major roads and have major investment. But I wonder if he, if he plans to do much work on some of the more intermediate roads. I'm thinking of like the A85, Perth, Cree and Larach, A82, Glasgow, Fort William, Inverness, and A30, Fort William, Malaig. Uh, are these roads going to get investment? Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll take that one. I thank the member for the question. What I would say is, uh, of course, working with uh, stakeholders in the food and drink industry is, is, is hugely important. Now, uh, some of the roads that he mentioned there uh, are good examples. I would add to that there's been a lot of calls for us to invest uh, more in the A77 and the A75, <coughs> with a particular focus on the ports of Ken Ryan, because there's obviously a lot of food and drink cargo uh, travels on those arterial routes. Uh, what I would say is, as a government, we listen to those stakeholders and take action where we can. A good example of that would be, I think one of the roads he mentioned was the 82, so Tarbot and Vernon scheme, uh, which again, he may be familiar with. It was the hauliers, the freight industry that came to us and said, look, you need to make that road wider. Uh, you know, we don't think it's wide enough. HGVs potentially might, well, clip mirrors and yeah. there's a lot of tight spots. So we took that on board. And of course, we agreed to widen the road at a cost, of course, to, to the government. But that's an example of uh, where we're listening to, to the food and drink industry and other uh, you know, uh, freighters and, and hauliers of, of cargo uh, and try to act and intervene where we can. On the roads that he specifically mentioned, what I would say is we're going through a process. We have the National Transport Strategy Review, which he's aware of. That will then feed into the STPR, Strategic Transport Projects Review, which is really the main document when it comes to future investment into road infrastructure. And the roads that he mentioned, of course, we'll be looking at them, exploring them, uh, whether they get future investment will, of course, depend on spending priorities, uh, our own budget constraints, and a whole range of, of, of factors. Just press with one supplementary. Uh, I mean, would you then emphasise roads which were particularly crucial to food and drink? Because, I mean, we, we've got huge ambitions, which we mm. all support uh, for growing the exports. So something like the 82 between uh, Tarbert North uh, to the top of Loch Lomond uh, would still seem to me a kind of a, uh, a sticking point. Uh, so if the food and drink industry was kind of seeking priorities in these, would they be listening to these? It's certainly a factor, but you'll also bear in mind that as a government, we have an ambition to move cargo and freight from road to rail. So, I mean, Cabinet Secretary is doing a power of work on that, whether it's on timber or food and drink. Uh, and so we're on the cusp of some exceptionally exciting, uh, I think, game changers in that respect. So, yes, of course, we would take that into account, but we try to look for a holistic solution, which doesn't just focus on the road, but also perhaps on uh, moving uh, freight from, from road to rail. But yeah, certainly it would be a factor. Okay, thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, the next question is Fulton McGregor. Thanks, Convener. Um, when we took the evidence session um, from the, the, the two panels recently, there was a bit of discussion around um, devolved tax measures. Um, it, just to, to ask the Cabinet Secretary if there'll be a full review of the, the business rate system, if that's on the radar or an extension of the the small business scheme? Um, well, again, this is not my, my uh, particular area, but uh, I um, understand that there has recently been a review, the Barclay Review, carried out by Ken Barclay, a distinguished former banker, along with, I think, Nora Senior and Professor Russell Griggs, and it brought forward a series of recommendations, the vast majority of which I think the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, uh, Derek Mackay, has announced that he's, he's taking forward uh, and uh, you know I'm very pleased that uh, that that is the case so you know I, I know that 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 work being taken forward convener does involve a review of specific matters which perhaps don't hit the headlines you know for example in the renewable hydro field um, uh, a, a review into the way in which that is rated to avoid deterring small hydro schemes from coming on in, in the light of high increases in the rateable values in hydro following the revaluation. I just mentioned that as an example. I better not uh, go on too long. I know I, I never do that, convener, so I'll stop there. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yeah, just a supplementary, the, in terms of the Community Power, Empowerment Act as well, is there any, any thoughts on if we could do anything further to support 
the rollout of that. Um, sorry, I didn't catch. The Community Empowerment Act. Um, you know, in order to uh, look at offering rates relief for local groups. It's the whole the whole theme of my question, Cabinet Secretary. Yes. On the, the uh, tax well, I'm, I'm advised that the Community Empowerment Act, which, with which I had no involvement, but it allows councils to create and fund their own local relief schemes to meet local needs and circumstances. And I think to date, Aberdeen, Aberdeenshire, and Perth and Kinross have utilised um, these powers to support local businesses. So I suppose you know other local authorities could look could look to what what uh, has been done in those three local authorities and perhaps see if there's lessons to be learned from that. Um, I think that's, that's one aspect of the Community Empowerment Act. I'm afraid that uh, because it's not my portfolio, I'm not particularly well versed in the detail of that. Though. Thank you. Uh, Richard Law. Yes, good morning. <coughs> With the disaster that is uh, Brexit, many thousands of overseas workers are now leaving these islands to grow uh, our food and drink industry, we need workers. So how can the, the Scottish Government support um, companies to have the workforce they need? How can we support them to upskill and reskill uh, the workforce in order to uh, make sure that our food and drink industry does grow? Well, there's a number of ways in, in which we provide support for um, training uh, and education, and of course much of this is through the uh, orthodox system of universities, colleges and apprenticeships and our headline target for, uh, a, for the creation of apprenticeships. There's also a lot that is done in the various sectors of the rural uh, economy, and much of it is done by, by industry. I mean, farming, for example, with co-ops such as Ringlink can provide uh, excellent schemes, and I've visited this particular one in providing internships and training for young people to bring them forward into farming to get new entrants, something that's very important. But I think uh, Mr Lyle is absolutely right to highlight you know, a thematic problem that faces the whole rural economy, and that is the reliance on people who have chosen to make their lives in Scotland, who have come from Romania, who have come from Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, from Poland, and who are very welcome in Scotland. And the First Minister has just made our position absolutely clear that we want to be a welcoming country and we want people who've made this choice to feel welcome here. And I think the whole Brexit experience has put a serious question mark over that. I've learned from fruit pickers, for example, convener, I met senior uh, representatives in that sector, that already they think they've lost perhaps 10% of people who formerly would have uh, expected to work are not coming back. Um, and that's before the season begins. Uh, and the same, the same reliance is, is the case in, uh, across the whole rural sector in tourism and fish processing. In abattoirs, 95% of OVs uh, come from the EU, 95%. We can't operate a quality meat sector without effective slaughterhouses. And therefore, um, you know, I think that within the, the farming sector, certainly, and this is the mood at Agri-Scot that I attended recently, I think the desire is to cut the politics, get answers, and get clarity, and get clarity very quickly indeed, because if not, then businesses may simply be unable to operate in the rural economy eh, and in the tourism economy. So this is a, a very serious problem, but I sincerely hope that the Prime Minister will turn her thoughts to this and and tackle it, because I know from my discussions that George Eustace and, uh, uh, and Michael Gove are uh, themselves painfully aware of it, convener. So it's a problem that everybody can see, uh, and uh, everybody needs a solution uh, quicker. Uh, and we're talking really weeks if we're thinking ahead to the season for potato and fruit picking, for, just for example. Thank you for that. Um, my first job was as a, a grocery manager. Um, which I was in for roughly about 14 years. What steps can be taken to make the sector, uh, the food and drink sector, an attractive career of choice? Uh, are you committed to supporting the work of SDS, which I'm, I'm sure you are, to increase diversity of the workforce? And how effective can all this be prioritised with current funds? Um, well, a wide variety of measures. I mean, you know, plainly, some jobs are on low pay. I mean, we, we have to be quite candid about it, and that's precisely why the Scottish Government introduced the, the living wage. And, you know, I'm encouraged by steps that some major employers have taken. Um, 
you know, it's perhaps invidious to single out one, but just I recently did visit Aldi's and they told me that they have a, a minimum level of, of pay for their staff, a minimum, uh, which uh, they believe is quite, com uh, quite good in relation to, uh, to some others, for example. That's an example which others can follow. Uh, and then people progress from that up the pay scale. Uh, so that's, uh, that's uh, one uh, area. In order to make uh, careers uh, 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 attractive, um, we do need to kind of raise awareness of the possibilities in the rural economy. Um, I think we need to have mentoring schemes, have more learning opportunities through modern apprenticeships. And I know from my travels that more apprenticeships are being delivered. Uh, and Henry Graham, the agricultural champion, has produced a, an excellent set of recommendations, which I would commend to this committee in their deliberations uh, today and subsequently. Uh, the four champions have produced practical solutions and sensible suggestions that I hope uh, are not being neglected because they're very worthy of consideration. He spent a lot of time looking at this area and he's come up with a number of practical suggestions uh, working very much with the, the rural economy and uh, I um, certainly believe that they should be taken forward in our, in our future plans. Thank you. Uh, the next question is Jamie Green. You know, good, good morning, panel. Um, I wondered if I could start uh, by looking at the budget uh, relevant to the Cabinet Secretary's uh, brief. Um, for the benefit of the panel, it's page 155 of the budget under the section Rural Services Spending. Um, the Rural Services Budget is supposed to support sustainable rural development, which deliver economic, environmental and community benefits. But I see its budget's been cut by 25%, and I appreciate the comments the Cabinet Secretary made in light of its overall budget reduction. But I wondered if someone in the panel could explain the quite drastic cut to budgets such as agriculture and horticultural advice and support, animal health, and indeed the food industry support line has gone down as well. How does that fit in with the government's ambitions of the 2030 ambition? Well, the overall reductions are, as I have said, and the, as I've already made clear, that the achievement of our ambitions will largely be delivered by, by businesses. That's how an economy works. Uh, you know, government isn't there to fund everything. Government is there to assist, to provide essential public services, which everybody relies upon. But it's not there on its own to create and contribute in, in its entirety the economic growth. That's not the way, in, I mean, I was in business myself, and. I never actually got any help from government. I didn't really expect any, and the less I saw of government, frankly, the better, and quite a lot of businesses operate in that way. They get on with the business, and they're working very, very hard every day around the clock in the rural economy, a long hours, to deliver success. So, you know, I don't actually think there is an equation, but as far as the technical question goes, uh, I think one of my officials wants to answer this. I'm not quite sure whether it's Ms. Turpey or Mr. Shedden. Mr. Shedden. Certainly, yes. I think um, the, the issue here is that there is a large degree of variability um, between spending plans um, across different years, and this budget simply reflects the reprioritisation and changing uh, nature of these plans, particularly in, in one of the areas highlighted, um, one, one of the... Um, aspects of the food, well, the food and drink cut really relates to capital, which wasn't actually being spent. Um, and there is a capital pot within the wider uh, REC budget, which is available to support food and drink should it be needed. Um, so that was a particular reason for that cut. But, but the, there are many variations across the lines. I don't know, Ms Turpey might want to say something about the detail. Um, with regard to the animal health budget, um, work is ongoing to scope a replacement for the ageing IBM computer system with a, dis apologies, a bespoke... Mul yeah. That you uh, just put the animal health budget on, on hold at the moment because we're going to come back to that. Right, I'd like okay. to, if I may, just try and focus in on the, on the food and drink aspect. All oh, right, sorry, so, apologies. Sorry, yeah, I you were Jamie, about can, I, can I ask you to follow up if you want sure, to? Sure, yes, sir. I think uh, yeah, I appreciate what the <laughs> Cabinet Secretary says, that business uh, is uh, quite a vital part. I guess our, our, our job in the committee is to scrutinise the budget and, and the plans that have been set forward um, and how the government is going to support the food and drink industry and to me, it seems like a 25% cut in the rural services plan doesn't go any way towards supporting the industry uh, in that respect, which is the 
rationale behind my question. I get on a similar vein, um, the, 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 the Cabinet Secretary mentioned earlier the uh, plans for export and growth and taking Brand Scotland overseas. Again, there's no real changes to the level of funding for SDI in the budget either. So I wondered if that may hinder or uh, help the, the ambitions to um, grow the work of SDI. Cabinet Secretary. SDI is uh, not an area for which I'm responsible, but I do know that they, you know, they're always focusing on where their expenditure can deliver the most success. And the, the in-market specialist, I think, is demonstrably an area where um, 11 individuals have produced enormous results, enormously successful results for Scotland and Scottish business. Um, but I think George Burgess might be in a position to give further technical detail in answer to you know, a fair question from Mr Green. Yes, yeah, certainly. I, mean, I think it's important that the, the element that you've picked out within the rural services is only one small element of the wider food uh, budget. So the support through the Food Processing Marketing and Cooperation Grant sits elsewhere uh, in, in the budget. And so there is no need for capital to be allocated here when, in fact, there is adequate capital available elsewhere in the budget. In relation to SDI, as the Cabinet Secretary has said, the, the scheme within market specialists has already been very successful. That is, is protected. Uh, my responsib responsibilities also include trade, and through the enterprise budget, um, there is additional funding for expansion of SDI's presence in Europe, a doubling of SDI's presence, and some of that will be in support of food and drink across Europe, our most critical market. Thank you very much for that. And just uh, to clarify for the benefit of the committee, you mentioned that that particular budget is only a small part of the overall food budget. Yes. Could you give us an overview of the overall food budget and whether that's gone up or down since last year's draft uh, uh, budget? And if you don't have that information at hand, welcome to send it to us in writing, perhaps. Um, I think we, can, we can certainly provide details of, of how those budgets are are, are, are broken down and you know, quite a number of the other budgets in the portfolio are also supporting, at least in part, uh, food and drink industries. That would be appreciated. So that, that can be submitted in writing, Cabinet Secretary, that would be very helpful. Uh, jo John, do you want to... Uh, Mike. Officials, because the Minister was not able to, to elucidate on the... £60 million pound fall in the budget. And following on for that question, if, 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 if um, the panel are sending information to the committee on whether the food and drink industry had cuts, could we actually expand that to find, find out what has happened uh, with the budget going from £2,866 million to £2,806 million? So where, where the £60 million pound cut in the budget is taking place because I think that's a fundamental question and if they could write to us with that that would be very helpful I, I, I think that is what? okay thank thank you I, I think that, that that's a valid point and what I would say is considering the tight timetable it needs to be almost an immediate response to be for us to be able to complete our report on time before we leave uh, food and drink and move on to other areas in the budget Cap some of the the answers which contribute largely to the answer to the question now there's uh, six bullet points I can s simply read them out if you wish um, if, if you have. Yes, I mean, I will, it's up to you, I, or I can I, write to you. I don't mind. I, I think if you, if you, cabinet secretary, I think considering the timescales for for not only this meeting but also that they be very helpful to have a written response, but as soon as possible, if please. Can I just before we leave this subject? Can I just ask a, a question? Is the, the Scottish food and drink industry um, has has really built on the successes of some key players, whether it be whisky. Uh, salmon production or other areas of production. There are some other areas of production where added value could, could lift them into the next stage. And just to ask the Cabinet Secretary within the budget where you've allowed for this and, and what promotion you'll be carrying out to the non-key sectors to try and make them to deliver the 2030 target that we're looking for. Sure. Um, well, a very fair question. Uh, I mean, one of there's, there's, there's two real answers to that. There's one that's to provide assistance to small businesses who are being successful to make, to make the, the step up in scale. For example, 
a, you know, a business that's newly supplying a supermarket uh, and gone from being a small local business to supplying a supermarket three, six, five days a year. That involves a lot of expansion of business. It involves a lot of business skills. And we therefore are, and I'll, I can give details, we have a scheme which we're just introducing which will encourage, help, mentor, assist those small businesses to make that leap. And again, I've discussed this in many meetings with most of the major uh, supermarkets. Uh, uh, so that's a form of business support in our food and drink budget that I really think will help us see, you know, tomorrow's, uh, uh, you know, bars, a, a walkers, Grahams, and so on, because many of the food and drink businesses started off as family businesses, you know, some generations ago, and they made that step. We want others to do that. Um, also, I may say that, you know, supermarkets themselves are doing that. Sometimes they come in for a lot of flack, but actually they provide a lot of help themselves to promote their smaller suppliers to help them grow, uh, and that's good. Second, the second answer, I think, is that you know, let's take one example of, of uh, shellfish. I mean, shellfish, uh, Scottish shellfish is a delicious product enjoyed all over the world and exports are particularly important, particularly to Europe actually, but also further afield. Um, and there are constraints in growth there. Actually, I heard about at a, a recent uh, annual meeting of uh, shellfish growers and producers and a, therefore, you know, that's an area where better marketing, for example, could assist equally. In the um, pelagic sector, for example, highly successful uh, sector, the Norwegians have dominated certain markets, for example, Japan. Uh, and although it's not part of the current year's particular spend, uh, there is opportunities, I think, to, to break into and establish a presence in major international markets in a particular pelagic sector. As Mr. Stevenson will be well aware of um, this. So, um, and uh, in, the food and, uh, in the drink sector, we've seen lots of artisan gin uh, distillers, for example, come on leaps and bounds over recent years. And again, some of them want to make the next step up. And equally in real ales and beers, ciders, uh, again, lots of, lots of small businesses that are getting a presence on major retailer shelves wanting to make that next step up. So, you know, I, I think uh, that is a very good question, Convener, if I may say so. Um, there are many, many small businesses in Scotland that uh, some of whom will, if they get the right support uh, and the right advice and with, uh, with effort on their part, can make the next step up to become very major players indeed, and that would be a terrific thing. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move on to the next question, Peter, Peter Chapman. Um, yeah, uh, we've heard lots about cuts to various budgets, but there, there is one there's one budget line that's increased uh, spectacularly, and that's a leader fund. That's gone up 127% from 10.1 million to 22.9 million next year, which is which would appear to be great good news. I just wonder why is there so much extra money in the leader fund, and what outcomes will we get from this extra spend? Um, well, I, I think the, the main, uh, Mr. Chapman is quite right that uh, the, the spend, estimated spend has increased. And this is really a facet of the nature of the leader program. It has a slow start and spend peaks around years four and five. I mean, these tend to be projects uh, to establish community facilities, for example. So the first two or three years is a sort of planning stage. Uh, and then you get into the implementation stage. So. I think it's a facet of the leader program and the previous leader program that you have a spending peak around year four to five. Um, the uncertainty around Brexit has caused three responses to the way funding has been committed, that local action groups have accelerated spend, they've paused spend or continued as usual. And as a consequence, the spend has been realigned to, to reflect the differences in commitments and forecast spend. So I, I hope that that is an explanation of that particular matter. And have we, do we know how, how this is going to impact, you know, what, what can we expect to, uh, this extra spend to deliver? Well, le leader actions result in a number of things. We've got community action on climate change, enhanced rural services, including transport initiatives, enhanced natural cultural heritage, tourism and uh, leisure, support for food and drink initiatives, 
cooperation with other local action groups and exchange of learning and knowledge um, with each other. So, you know, there's a wide kind of variety of different types of, of uh, projects and a, therefore I think we'd want to and we will see achievements in all these areas. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. The, the next question is from me, Cabinet Secretary. The payments and inspections administration costs have increased. Uh, there's a split between staff and depreciation. If we could home in on the staffing costs, if I may, it's a 16.4% increase. And if, if you look at the level four sheets, it gives reasons for that. I would like to ask how much of that 16.4% increase is due to establishing a sustainable IT support and uh, for the CAP IT system. So how much of that 16.4% increase is down to the CAP IT system, Cabinet Secretary? Right, okay. Well, if, if I may, I'll pass that question to Annabel Turpey. Um, I would like to write you on that, or rather get Mr Turnbull to write you on that, because I don't have the specific figures there. But what I can tell you is that this is about, um, a, this covers a range of things. So it's actually across SAS as well, and it's about fully funding the pay bill of nearly 1,000 agricultural staff across Scotland and SA, across ARPID and SASA. Um, it's progressing the National Development Plan for crofting and the agricultural holding provisions in the Land Reform Scotland Act. So I know it's not all solely related to the IT, but we will get back to you because I don't have that information in front of me. Annabelle, and, and just to remind you that I'm particularly asking on, on the CAP IT, not yeah. on the other aspects that you've mentioned. Yeah. And Cabinet Secretary, if I could follow that up by uh, the second part of the question is the depreciation uh, costs have increased by a, a mild 78% or within a p points of 78%. Could you just explain to me how much of that 78% in cash terms is relevant to writing down the IT systems, uh, please? Yeah, I, th I think uh, Annabel will answer this one as well. Okay. So um, the difference in depreciation from 1718 to 1819 is an additional 10 million on the futures IT side, depreciation. So it's 10 million pounds that is the depreciation on the CAP IT system? Yeah. I'm seeing An you, addition. Stuart. Sorry, I'm going to continue to answer, to press the question. Sorry, 10 million. So there is, in terms of the increase, um, there is an additional 10 million from last year, which is about depreciation on the spend on the, the IT, including additional spend this, uh, last year and this year, as Mr Turnbull set out at previous committee hearings. Okay, okay Stuart, I did catch, your, catch you waving frantically, if you'd like um, to come in now. Yeah. It, it was just to seek a confirmation that, of course, depreciation is a non-cash yes. item. Um, and if I could come in on that, that, that is absolutely right. And it will not be taking money away from frontline, um, you know, sort of nurses or, or teachers. It is actually a very normal accounting practice. I don't know if Mr Shedden wants to say more on this, but it is absolutely part of the non-cash. It, I, I absolutely understand that depreciation is a non-cash item, but it is in budgets to facilitate the replacement of equipment in, in future years. So I understand that. Um, can I just also clarify, um, the, the, could you just give me uh, an idea of the depreci depreciation that's been set on the stud farm, which, which I visited in, and is an excellent facility? Um, I don't have that information in front of me, but we can... Come back on that one, Mr. Mentor. Okay. Uh, so uh, the next question is Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Convener. Um, can I ask about the veterinary surveillance budget, um, which has fallen by 19.3%? Can I ask if that's going to impact on services? Will there be services cut? And especially in rural and remote areas, which have had cuts in the past? I'm really sorry, I didn't hear the question. Um, I'm asking about the veterinary surveillance budget, which has fallen by 19.3%. Okay. And I'm just wondering what impact that's going to have on I mean, services. Annabelle, we'll look for the detail, but I mean, the, the headline answer to that, I think, is that you know, we do work very closely with SRUC and Morden, and indeed, you know, I visited Morden recently and worked with SRUC and indeed encouraged... Uh, facilitated the uh, increased cooperation between ISRUC, who are now co-locating at Morden as a tenant, 
of Morden, no doubt to the financial advantage of both <coughs> being able to realise savings by sharing the uh, substantial building, part of which frankly was empty, and therefore by encouraging that move there, I, I assume that, uh, although I haven't got the figures from them yet, that SRUC and Morden in fact will be making a substantial saving on the other options which uh, SRUC were looking at, which I think included a new build at uh, uh, a university campus. But we do work closely with SRUC and Morden to ensure that the veterinary surveillance programme is effectively delivered and the, the partnership between the two organisations will deliver efficiencies as well as improve the effectiveness of the overall programme. But I don't know if Annabel can you add to that. Thank you. Okay. So there will be no cuts in service? Well, we always seek greater efficiencies in the way that we operate, particularly in these straitened times. <laughs> you, uh, right <laughs> that doesn't really answer my question. I'm not feeling particularly reassured. But, however, um, spend on the public good, uh, the public good advisory service is going to fall as well. And I'm wondering, because some of the, the um, um, plan schemes haven't come into fruition, I'm wondering which ones haven't come into fruition. Why are they being dropped? I think there were two schemes that we were looking to consider implementing, but after reflection we decided that they wouldn't necessarily represent the best value for money. Um, and uh, what I can't remember is, uh, because we didn't we decided not to pursue them, this was some time ago, I'm not quite sure if I, I can recall which they were, but I can certainly write to you, convener, to explain that if you wish. That would be useful. And if, I, if I may come, come in Annabelle. and say that that, that discussion was done with stakeholders so we you know it wasn't a sort of internal decision taken by itself it was done in in conjunction with stakeholders looking at the efficiency and effectiveness of the programs okay uh, the next question is rich love um cabinet secretary what is your view uh, regarding the budget funding to support emission reduction from the agricultural sector um do you think it's sufficient, given that agriculture and related land use is the third largest source of emissions in Scotland? Um, well, I, I think the, the funding is uh, sufficient. And again, you know, the best way of cutting emissions is to get the buy-in of farmers. Uh, for example, you know, nitrate vulnerable zones were introduced some particular time ago. There was a lot of controversy at the time. Uh, uh, and indeed, more recently, there was introduction in the southwest which led to, to sort of teething pains. But I, I think now there's a wide buy-in that the gains to the environment were, were uh, you know, worthwhile and necessary in terms of reducing water pollution uh, and so on. So, so that's one example. Uh, a, a, another current example is, is, uh, is the use of soil testing and other technological advances. And my goodness me, other technological advances that one sees at places like AgriScot. Um, the testing, of course, in itself doesn't really achieve anything other than an analysis of the acidic content of the soil, but it can then be used to determine how best to deploy fertilizer and to avoid the overuse of fertilizer. And this is very, very good for the environment uh, because you're not, you're not putting in extra, extra fertilizer and chemicals beyond what is required. Um, and, you know, on, on companies, and I saw a presentation from Bartlett's at a, an event I attended with the Royal Bank not so long ago, and, you know, they demonstrated that, you know, individual fields will be analysed in terms of their soil quality in order to, make, to get the best yield of potatoes, uh, for example. So the point I'm making, convener, is that uh, to get buy-in from farmers that what is good for the environment is good business practice as well, I think, is the, is the ideal. And that's been the kind of approach that we are, we are taking, um, the carrot rather than the stick, if you like. Uh, although, of course, we keep these, this approach under, under review. But that's a general... The, the, the funding, we believe, is therefore uh, sufficient to, to tackle um, water and air quality, biodiversity, and tackle emission reduction as well. I have another two questions. Uh, Can, uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, John Finney would like a supplementary on that particular okay. area before you move on to the next one. Uh, if you've finished on that particular area, Richard. Yeah, I have uh, another two questions, but I'll give yes. way to my colleague. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Convener. Thank you, Excellent. Uh, good morning, panel. Cabinet Secretary, I, I, I note that you concluded there by saying that you would keep this issue under review, but there's very clearly a reduction in the peatland restoration funding to support the emission budget for the uh, emission reductions in the agricultural sector. Also, with regard to another area you touched on, which was the public good advisory service, uh, again a reduction there, and um, we're advised that it's yet to be determined uh, what will happen about the climate change initiatives element of that. Would you be able to say when that would be made known, please? Well, I, I think some of these areas, I'm not trying to duck the question, but you know, some of these areas are being dealt directly by Rosanna Cunningham because they fall largely within our portfolio. I mean, I think you know, there is good news. I'm, I'm inclined to defend farmers here. There is good news from farmers from the steps that they are taking together in partnership with government. I mean, for example, it is worthy of note uh, that the 2015 statistics show that agricultural emissions are down by more than 25 per cent from the 1990 baseline level. So in terms of emission reductions, not only are we heading in the right, right direction, but Scotland <coughs> does lead the way uh, for the rest of the UK. But I think the, the points that Mr Finney raises, I'm certainly happy to pursue in a letter, because I think repeatland reduction and environmental advice, those are matters that I'm not dealing on a day-to-day -day basis, convener. I think uh, I would prefer to make sure Ms Cunningham is cited in these to give you the highest quality responses. Thank Richard. You. Yes, uh, my second question is, um, and you remember that this committee wants, uh, is imploring you to plant more trees, so do you think that the increased budget for woodland grants will allow this plant, the plant targets to be met? Um, yes, I think we are moving towards achieving our target. The increase in funding to 46 million in woodland grants uh, includes increasing the forestry grant scheme um, woodland creation budget to 40 million in 2018-19. And we anticipate this, this will be sufficient to deliver 9,500 hectares of, uh, of uh, new planting. And uh, in addition, uh, I think uh, Forest Enterprise uh, plan further hectareage as well. So um, we're moving very substantially upward from previous years where, sadly, we, we did not achieve the targets. And this is as a result of increased grants, but it's also a result of the McKinnon review, it's a result of uh, the benefits we're seeing in the investment, increased investment in the Timber Transport Fund, mostly road, but looking at some exciting opportunities on rail freight for timber uh, as well. Um, and it's also, I think, a result of having galvanised the sector in forestry summits and very close engagement with, uh, with uh, uh, CONFOR, the STTA, the UK FPA and other commercial players to encourage further investment in forestry and also finally convener working with uh, local authorities where forestry is particularly important and I've met individual local authorities to discuss this and work together with them to work out the best place for new plantings because it's absolutely essential that we have the right tree in the right place and good silvicultural practice is observed both for coniferous and broadleaf, both native and non-native species. These are matters primarily for foresters to determine working with local authority partners. And that partnership is being worked on directly at my behest with John Dugan of the Forestry Commission and the likes <coughs> of Borders, Dumfries and Galloway and many other local authorities. So I think overall, and there's, there's many parts I haven't mentioned, the research, the nurseries and so on, there's, there's a, a, a collective effort across the forestry sector um, including sheep and trees, the involvement of farmers, advice to farmers, which has been a terrifically successful funding scheme that has been initiated and work the SRUC is doing as well. So, so it's, a, it's a broad and detailed tapestry, convener, but the results are we're heading very much towards achieving our targets sooner rather than later. Um, you've actually been asked this question before in discussions regarding the, the forestry bill, but uh, do you believe that the Forestry Commission Scotland can continue to deliver all its requirements and responsibilities uh, in face of some budget reductions? Um, yes, I am confident in the abilities of uh, the workforce and the Forestry Commission to achieve uh, and fulfil all its uh, functions. And the reason I'm confident is that I've met most of them and I've spoken to them and I've visited all the conservancies as well as Sylvan House. Uh, and I've been struck by their commitment to what is a calling, not just a job. 
around the country and the com complex nature, the professional nature of what they do, and that's something we're determined to continue after devolution is complete. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Richard Peter. Thank you. Um, Cabinet Secretary, one of the biggest, if not the biggest, contributor to the new non-domestic rates on shootings and deer forests is going to be, I would guess, the Forestry Commission. So have you calculated what this rates bill will be for the Forestry Commission, and in this, is this factored into the budget? A, yes, we are working on that matter currently, um, and uh, the, I, fr from memory, convener, the estimated total liability estimate of uh, the forest, uh, uh, forest enterprise uh, as it will be largely, is around about a million pounds per annum. So that's a very substantial amount of money. Um, we take the view that the role that the Forestry Commission do in deer management uh, should result in it being recognised that there should not be a liability to rates. There may be a rateable value, but there should be a relief. Uh, and indeed, in the legislation that was passed, uh, there is a specific clause that refers to deer management. So I think it was envisaged that the imposition of rates would be on actual sporting use of land in Scotland, not on forestry. That is the view that we take in the forestry, and therefore we're having discussions uh, with relevant parties there and then. I'd also add that uh, one of the recommendations in the Barclay Review was not that farmers be rated, but the farming be, be assessed for rating. We rejected this uh, recommendation. We did not think that was appropriate, and therefore it was, uh, we did not go ahead with that, and I think it's important to mention that. Sorry, can I just follow up slightly on that, Cabinet Secretary? At the moment, uh, I'm aware the Forestry Commission have various deer larders around Scotland, which they are used in conjunction with deer management, which are all subject to rating and which they pay rates on. On the basis that you're suggesting they may be getting rates relief on, on the stalking, will you be applying for rates relief on the deer larders which they've accepted in the past? Well, I think what I'm saying is there's a distinction between forestry land which is used for shooting and which should be subject to the law. Uh, uh, and on one hand, and forestry which is not used for shooting on the other hand. And the broad point is that land which, uh, that land which is afforested where there is no shooting conducted and no shooting let, because they do let out uh, some of their estate for, um, a, for sporting use. The forestry land, a, where there is deer management, should not be subject to rates. That is our view, and that's a view and a discussion that we're taking forward with the relevant authorities. You're raising the deer larder aspect, and that's, I think, slightly different. I mean, obviously, where there is a liability to rates, then public bodies must pay them. The argument I'm making is that um, at the moment, it appears to, to me that uh, there is a very strong argument that the, um, that the approach that the assessors are taking uh, is one which uh, uh, we need to probe and question, and there's meetings being conducted in order to finalise those discussions. Of course, the assessors are entirely independent of the Scottish Government, and it may well be that, that uh, the normal way of things is that appeals have to be entered against the proposed valuations, rateable values, as entered in the valuation role. Uh, Peter. <coughs> uh, I'm, I'm quite confused by that answer because the farming businesses right up and down the, the length and breadth of Scotland have, have had their businesses assessed for rates for shooting, whether they shoot on that land or not. So why should it be different for, for a forested uh, area? Because they don't actually shoot on it. Because, as I say, a uh, Far farmers, arable farmers and other farmers who don't shoot and get no shooting income have been assessed for these rates? Well, you know, these, these are fair, fair questions there, I think, really for the um, assessors in Scotland, and uh, I would recommend the committee pursue them with the, uh, with the assessors. The point I was making, convener, earlier was that, that there was a recommendation in the Barclay view that farming land as farming land should be rated, and we rejected that. But I do appreciate that the assessors have taken the view that there needs to have been a, a, an assessment for the purposes of computing a rateable value of some agricultural land which could be used for shooting. And that was a decision, as I understand it, and I hope I'm not misrepresenting anybody, was taken by the assessors who are independent of government. So out of fairness to them, 
I do think, actually, Mr Chapman's question is one that should be addressed to them. Mm. Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Can I take you back to, to, to trees, if I may? Um, I, th I think the committee has always expressed an opinion that uh, the increased planting of trees is good and, and is being encouraged. Can I just confirm, I mean, the planting targets that you, you aspire to, and I think the committee support, would suggest that the draft budget for uh, next year and the year after to reach those planting targets would have to be considerably higher than it is. Do you, do, do you feel that, are you concerned that it's not higher and you're still going to be able to, just like this recorded, that, that you are going to meet your planting targets? In which year? Well, next year and the year after. Uh, well, we're moving towards achieving the target. I think I've given the estimate of 9,500 hectares next year, on top of which I believe that uh, Forest Enterprise expect to, if you like, bridge the gap to the 10,000 target. And again, I can provide more detail with that, with some supplementary information from Simon Hodge of Forest Enterprise. The point I'm making was that, sadly, we fell very far short of reaching our targets in the past. I've been quite candid about that. I think that uh, good progress has been made across the board, and I think we're very close to achieving our target. I hope we, we reach it. I'm not going to say that we will at the moment, convener, but I'm confident that we will. Um, but of course, it's a matter of uh, the, the real constraint, I think if Jo O'Hara were here, she would say, as she said to me, that the real constraint is not the availability of investment, it's the availability of land that's suitable for forestry. That has been the, the practical constraint, and that's precisely why I've invested quite a lot of time and energy in reaching out to all involved to work in partnership, particularly local authorities who have a big role to play, and to local authorities in areas like the south of Scotland where forestry is so important uh, to encourage that we work very closely together, far more closely together than before, in coming to a workable plan that is suitable for local authorities and communities affected too, because after all, you know, <laughs> local authorities and councillors represent their local areas and know it perhaps be better than, arguably better than anybody. So, um, so the approach we are taking is designed to meet the targets. I'm fairly confident that we are just about to do so, and I fully intend to drive forward uh, the good measures that we've introduced, the increase in grant money, the increase in timber transport fund, the streamlining of the procedures through the McKinnon report, the growth of restocking by nurseries, and also the importance of research and the excellent research one done um, at Roslyn, which I visited last week and which will continue as a separate agency of the Forestry Commission in the UK. So it's, as you know, convener, it's, it's, a, it's a big picture. There's lots of pieces in this jigsaw, but I'm reasonably confident that we will achieve our targets, that the funding is sufficient to enable us so to do, and we are driving forward across the board with the sector uh, to, to reach our objectives. Okay, Cabinet Secretary, and I, just a question. Without meaning to prejudge what the Parliament decides on the forestry bill, I believe there was a financial implication cost of some about eight million in the forestry bill, and you indicated to the committee that one of the first things that would need to happen uh, with the new organisation would be a new computer system. Could you just uh, enlighten me to how much that computer system's gonna cost? and where, where it appears in the budget, if that's going to happen in the short term, and where the eight million will be in the budget uh, for the rebranding and the reorganization of the Forestry Commission. Right, well, these, these were figures in the financial memorandum of the bill. Correct. Um, these figures haven't been finalized, so the work, as I think I explained in, to the committee in a previous occasion, is being examined at the moment uh, in relation to the rebranding costs uh, 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 and the IT costs. You remember, convener, I'm sure, that uh, the computer system in the Forestry Commission as a whole needed to be replaced anyway. So this was work that I was advised needed to be done anyway as part of the uh, a replacement of outmoded uh, a, a equipment. Um, but uh, we have increased the overall Forestry Commission budget by 2.4 million. Um, and I'm confident that a, with the, the prudent stewardship of Simon Hodge and Joe O'Hara working closely with Scottish Government officials that we will manage to live within our means. Um, Cabinet Secretary, um, 
um, I, I'm not quite sure how to ask that, uh, answer that in the sense that you're suggesting that eight million pounds, which is for the rebranding, and, and whatever the computer system costs are, which you haven't worked out yet, will be covered by a £2.4 million increase in the Forestry Commission budget. Well, well, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm, I don't see how that works. Perhaps you could, if, if you are unable to, to, to tie those figures down, be very happy to receive that in writing post the committee. Well, we, I, I'll certainly do that, but just, just to complete the explanation that the, um, the costs that we require on IT and rebranding have not yet and cannot yet be fully estimated. We're not at the stage where we can do that. And, as I've said before, I want to make sure these costs are kept to a minimum. Uh, I want the money to go on planting trees, putting it, putting it crudely. I don't want more money that is necessary going on um, rebranding, for example. So that clear instruction has been given, but we're not yet at the stage of getting actual estimates. Uh, we're still uh, ascertaining I mean, after all, the, the law hasn't been passed by the Scottish Parliament yet. It would be rather surprising if a perfect 100% plan were formulated before the legislation is even through. And this is something that we are dealing with uh, in relation to the forestry bill rather than the budget. For that reason, we're not yet at the stage of, of uh, moving to the accounting phase, if you like. We're still at the planning stage of, of, uh, of uh, these measures. But, but having had detailed discussions in, in meetings with... A, the leaders of both Commission and Forest Enterprise, I am confident that they will keep within their budget. Okay. Um, my only comment to that would be prudence is, would suggest that, that, that you have an allowance in there, even if you don't use it all. Stuart, the next question is yours. Thank you, Convener, and I want to ask a, a number of questions uh, in areas uh, related to connecting Scotland, uh, focusing on perhaps areas not, uh, not not fully covered uh, by yesterday's statement. Um, the, one of the great successes of the Digital Scotland Supervast Broadband Programme, of course, has been the uh, higher than expected uh, take up of commercial services, uh, which I think has led to an increase in the amount uh, that will be available through gain share. And of course, in the coming year, gain share uh, will be an increasing proportion of the uh, expenditure that's. Uh, continuing to roll out uh, the DSSB programme. Um, does the Cabinet Secretary have uh, uh, anything to say about how much we might see from gain share? Uh, we can see in the budget, obviously, what the government's spending, but as more of it will be from gain share in the coming year, do we know what that might be? Well, I, I can say that thus far, um, 17.9 million of gain share funding has been generated uh, across both contracts, that's the, the one in the Highlands and Islands and which went first and the one in the rest of Scotland. And uh, this will enable delivery of fibre access to around 23,000 additional premises across Scotland during 2018. And as I said in the Chamber yesterday, every local authority in Scotland will see a benefit from this gain share. Gain share as a concept was created in the contracts um, <coughs> by reference to the anticipated additional custom that would be gained by BT, the contractor under the contract. There was an assumption, and I think the assumption was that 20% of people who had access as a result of the contract would sign up with BT. But in fact, the number of signing up exceeded that, and therefore BT gained commercially from it. And planning ahead in the contract, there was a mechanism called gain share, which meant that BT would pay back an additional amount for the additional customers that they got beyond the 20%, I think it was 20% assumption. So I think it was a, it was a, a well-planned contract. It was thought through. It was one where we had excellent relations with BT, uh, and it's one where we work closely with local authorities. If I may say so, uh, the way in which we procured this, as opposed to elsewhere in the UK, gained benefits of scale by having two contracts, not contracts for every local authority, which was the approach, I think, taken by Mr. Hancock in, in England. Uh, and therefore, the performance of, of DSSB in delivering over 800,000 uh, homes and businesses that are now able to access superfast broadband, I think has been a good example of public procurement working in practice and delivering more benefits than actually were planned, uh, convener. So I'm grateful to have an opportunity briefly to comment on that. Um, the 23,000 uh, 
connections that will be funded by GameShare. Uh, is, is that contributing to the reduction in the, that's led to the 285,000 uh, figure, which I think applies to the R100 programme, the remaining 5%, in other words? Uh, or, or is that simply uh, that uh, BT will be paying through gain share for 23,000 in the existing programme? Um, well, that's a, a very good question, and I think the answer is yes. The more successful DSSB contracts were, the ones that have been implemented were, the less there is to do. Uh, you know, by definition, R100 is to reach 100. That's 100%. So the closer you get to 100%, uh, the less there is to do, um, and therefore the benefits of DSSB are being manifest. It also make the point that it's only possible now to move to R100 because in defining the scope of that contract, uh, one has to identify <coughs> which homes and businesses in Scotland do not have access. Uh, and that means analysing data on a humongous scale. Analysing not only the data under the two DSSB contracts, but also the planned commercial interventions. So not only do we have to, as a specification for the R100 contract, uh, look at what we've done in, in the public sector, but also what's planned to be done in the private sector. So Mr. Stevenson is absolutely right. I think this is a, a it, uh, you know, it, it may be about as interesting as watching paint dry, but nonetheless, in terms of uh, successful public procurement, I think it has been pretty successful. Um, as uh, someone who individually uh, looks to benefit from the R100 programme, um, this is much more exciting than watching paint dry, Cabinet <laughs> Secretary. And I, I, I think a quick calculation suggests that the gain share programme uh, is contributing about one percentage point uh, in uh, moving us towards the targets that, that, that we're seeking, and that's terribly encouraging. Now, but on the gain share, do we, do we have a view as to how that money is going to be distributed among the various local authorities, or is that uh, a subject that we've not yet made decisions on? Well, in principle, the gain share investment will, de will be deployed in those local authority areas where there is the lowest level of coverage. So in principle, that is the approach that we're taking. And I think that the lowest speed coverage includes Aberdeenshire, Angus, Dumfries, Galloway, Perth and Kinross, Scottish Borders, Stirling, as well as the Highlands and Islands. So the rural areas, by and large, uh, will benefit most, as they, as they will do under R100. I mean, the preponderance of spend is for the north and the south rather than the centre in the three regional lots which there will be in R100. And no doubt... I'll be grilled on that several times uh, in my uh, very frequent appearances before this committee. And perhaps finally, um, do we have a profile for what the expenditure uh, might be over the next four financial years uh, up to the point where we've completed the R100 programme uh, in 2021? Well, we don't yet, and we can't yet. And we can't yet because you know, we're going to procurement. We haven't got the bids. Until we know what the bids are, then you know, we can't plan the spend. So we're not actually at that stage. We don't have the figures yet. What I would say though, and this is absolutely crucial, is that the R100 procurement has been planned, designed to maximize the chance of competition. Had we gone too early, we would only have got BT. Why would anyone a bit a, when BT were in control of the specification under the DSSB contract? Uh, a, a, and a, if we had lotted Scotland as one unit, then perhaps only one company would have been able to supply a bit. So that's why we've divided into three lots. And the evidence from down south does suggest that where there is competition in procurement, where there's more than one bidder, then bidders tend to shut <coughs> the pencil and the taxpayer tends to get the best value. So a lot of thought has been gone into this by experts, a, a to ensure that we get competitive bids. And logically, you know, only when we get the bids in can we then uh, deal with the profile of the spending because we don't at the moment know what the, what the bids uh, will be. Uh, we have, of course, created an allowance for each area, but you know, we can't predict what the outcome of the, of the tender process uh, will, will be. And as I explained yesterday, 
We hope that that process will be completed by early 2019. It's an extremely complicated process. Competitive dialogue is necessary to avoid non-compliant bids being received. <coughs> uh, and that all means that uh, this is it's absolutely essential to get procurement process right, as those who remember the procurement of this building will uh, remember only too well. Cabinet Secretary, can I just seek a point of clarification? I think the question Probably. Stuart asked you was uh, on the gain share was how will this money be assigned to local authorities? And, and your point was it will be deployed in the following areas. Does that mean that you'll be deploying it or it will be assigned to the local authorities in those areas? Could you just clarify that for me, please? Well, I, th I think I said the, the principle would be to focus investment on maximising superfast coverage in areas with the lowest speed coverage. That's the principle, but maybe... Um, so, uh, Rob, so it won't Robbie be assigned. Will, sorry, detail. Robbie. Yeah, so, I mean, in, in effect, the, the funded and gain, gain share funding will be deployed through existing contractual mechanisms. So um, the priori prioritisation that the Cabinet Secretary has spoken about has been agreed with all of the contributing partners, including local authorities. So it's focused BT's modelling in particular areas. But there's not a case of the funding will go <coughs> to local authorities for them to then deploy it. It's just reinvested through existing contractual mechanisms. Thank you, Robbie. That clarifies that that point. Rader, I think you've got a question and then we're going to move on to Jamie Green. Yes, um, just to quickly going back on to Stuart Stevenson's question, he asked how much we would receive in gain share and you didn't give him that <coughs> um, figure, you give him how many properties would benefit from it but not actually the monetary figure. So maybe you could provide how that is worked out and the figure to committee in writing if that's possible. Um, well, I think I did say 17.9 million has been generated so far across the contracts. I mean, the, the, I don't know whether, uh, and also 23,000 additional premises across Scotland during 2018. But I mean, is there any more information we've got, to Robbie, to answer the question? Well, it's just I mean, so that's the amount of gain share funding that's been generated thus far. There are trigger points within the, the contract that we'll see further gain share um, released, but but that's the the two figures that the cabinet secretary have quoted reflects the initial activity in 2018 funded by gain share. Okay, so we don't have a figure that will go into the alongside the budget figure that was released in the budget. There's not an additional figure that will. No. no. Okay. Um, can I also ask, and maybe get this in writing as well, about the voucher system that was um, announced yesterday in the statement? Again, it's probably lower down in the figures of the budget, but it would be interesting to know how much has been allocated to that and what will be the value of the voucher system, and indeed whether or not that fulfils um, the government's responsibility under R100 to those well, who it's available to. Well, if I can answer generally and pass to Robbie for any details that I've omitted, but I mean, the, the first answer and the, the most important answer is that our aim is to reach as many as possible of the R100 by fibre. That's the aim. And therefore, our aim in processing the competitive dialogue with bidders is to encourage that to the absolute maximum number <coughs> of homes and businesses are covered with access to fibre by um, provision of backhaul uh, rather than other methods. And therefore, you know, by definition, convener, only once we see what the outcome of the procurement process is, will we be able to ascertain what the remainder of the residue is, as well, to put it that way, of those who are left who are not going to be able to access through fibre means. But the first objective is to maximise those who can access by fibre. And only once that process is completed early in 19, can we make a definitive plan for the rest, but we can and we did briefly set out in outline the components of that plan. So does that cover it, Rob? Yeah, Rob, it else? does. I mean, I, th I think from our point of view, clearly um, we expect that that £600 million pounds that's been announced will drive coverage really extensively, fibre coverage into rural areas um, extensively. Um, we would hope that that would minimise the need for any kind of subsequent phases. And I think if we can achieve competition through the procurement, then that just increases that chance. Obviously, what we are doing at the moment is kind of scoping out what a voucher scheme would look like, how it would best be operated, how it could be made most user-friendly and accessible for the general public, how they could aggregate vouchers, that kind of thing. So we're working through all of that just now. But it is very much with the hope that it may not need to be utilised as fully as, as you might imagine, um, given the, the scale of the investment that's going through the initial procurement. Thank you. Uh, Jamie. Thank you, uh, Convener. Can I ask, uh, just to follow on from the point Mr McGee has just made, can I ask what um, liaison uh, uh, you are 
going through with uh, DCMS at the moment. There already is a UK-wide voucher scheme for people who are unable to access um, fibre cabinets. Is this an additional voucher scheme in addition to the UK one, uh, DCMS-led scheme, or is this a, a, a part of that scheme? It would be. I mean, we, we obviously administer the Better Broadband Scheme, which is a scheme you refer to on behalf of the UK government. So that's recently been extended until the end of 2018. Um, so we're obviously part of the work that we're doing around the voucher scheme is working with DCMS to, to obviously learn from the kind of experience that they've had and to plan on that basis. And I guess ideally we would be looking to get to a point where if the Better Broadband Scheme is extended beyond the end of 2018, then it is a kind of single access point for people so that it is kind of coordinated. So we've got engagement ongoing with DCMS in that regard. Okay, so the, 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 the announcement for a voucher scheme is based on extension of an existing scheme? Uh, no, no. So it would be a standalone scheme that would be, fun if needed in Scotland, it would be funded by Scottish government. But as I say, we're just looking to make sure that it is as seamless as possible in terms of people's experience of access and vouchers. Thank you. Um, moving on to the budget, um, if I could ask the Cabinet Secretary uh, if he could explain the reduction in the digital strategy capital budget uh, as a reduction of around £80 million. Pounds. There's £34 million in there for next year. Uh, could he explain what that £34 million is going to be spent on and why the reduction? Um, well, it, this, this relates to the kind of profile of spend and the reduction reflects the kind of updated delivery timelines for the R100 programme and the procurement began earlier this month with the OGU notice. It's expected to last one year. So obviously, the, you know, the, at one level, the high level, I mean, the major spend follows the procurement completion. The procurement process itself involves an element of professional cost, not inconsiderable, but the actual spend on laying fibre in the ground happens after the procurement is over, uh, and that would, t they would, would uh, commence in early a uh, 219. Uh, but gain share, and I want to stress this, we'll see new deployment in every local authority area in Scotland across 218, avoiding any significant gap between DSSB and R100 um, deployment. And I think it's also relevant to say that in addition to that, there will be spend on a mobile infill program, um, and we'll invest up to 25 million, including 10 million of ERDF, to deliver the 4G infill program. And this will help deliver a number of masts across rural Scotland to deal with non-spots in areas where we would not <coughs> expect the markets to provide the answer. In other words, areas where, unless there is public sector intervention convener nothing will happen uh, and uh, therefore the 4G infill programme was launched in August. The procurement will start in January. A supplier is expected to be in place by May and I would expect that there will be masks uh, uh, being delivered or the preparatory work being delivered by Q4 this year. So you know, I'm pleased to have an opportunity to say it's not all about broadband, it's also about mobile because there's far too many areas of Scotland where too many people you know, are suffering from, from non-spots. And our, our mobile action plan, the, the first day in the UK, has helped by s streamlining planning permissions to enable the swifter processing of applications for the erection of new mobile masts. So if I may clarify, the £34 million in the budget, the draft budget, is that funding DSSB mobile or R100? I'm a bit confused by that answer. So it's, it's a combination of all three. So it enables all three to proceed in the course of the, the year. I mean, as, as the Cabinet Secretary has outlined, there is a natural kind of ebb and flow around capital. So in 1718, uh, the DSSB programme kind of maximised spend, um, as has already been outlined. In this financial year, it's kind of moving more towards deployment through gain share. Um, but certainly in the course of 1819, um, the capital budget covers the 4G MPL programme that's been mentioned, but th there will be minimal costs of R100 deployment in 1819, just given the, the length of the procurement process that's, that's just been embarked upon. I, I think it's very important <coughs> to bear in mind, Convener, that there's also lots of commercial activity. I mentioned in the chamber yesterday the, com the companies involved in providing commercial provision for broadband, so that is going ahead as well in 2018, and it's going ahead a pace, actually, according to many of the main players, all of whom I've met. I'm pleased to hear that. Um, if we could then move on to R100, uh, the figure of 600 million was mentioned in the comprehensive statement made by the Cabinet Secretary yesterday. Um, could he just clarify that 579 million of that, uh, as confirmed in the Chamber yesterday, is coming 
directly from the Scottish Government's uh, capital investment budgets? Uh, yes, uh, all of the funding is coming from the Scottish Government. Uh, uh, that's broadly 579 million. Uh, 21 million is coming from the UK Government. That's 3.5%. Uh, uh, I should say I, I have uh, invited uh, Matt Hancock, the, my UK counterpart, on several occasions, most recently at a meeting in Edinburgh, to increase this somewhat measly contribution, particularly since broadband is a, a reserve matter, something confirmed recently in the UK industrial strategy, where it, that is, a vet, I think, a verbatim quote. So the UK should be paying for this, but they refuse to do so. Um, and uh, I don't know whether the reports may change uh, this morning, since I believe in the news this morning it emerged that the UK's plan to reach a contract, a voluntary contract with BP has, well, fallen apart. So I think they're going back to the drawing board convener, and I hope that they will revisit their plan to limit the aspirations of the connections in England to 10 megabits per second instead of 30 megabits per second, since their primary plan has uh, fallen apart. If I could bring us back to Scotland, uh, if, if I may. Um, thank you. Uh, so can the uh, Cabinet Secretary therefore explain, given that there's no R100 money in this year's draft budget, does that therefore mean that the £579 million will be spread across the next three years' budgets, given the reduction in the Sorry, overall... What, what will be spread? The £579 million. Oh. Will that, be, will that uh, appear in, in the next three years' budgets, therefore? It seems to be the only way it will appear if it's not in this year's budget. Um, well, as, as I say, you know, we, we, we are doing various things this year, and uh, that's been explained. But uh, the R100 uh, spend will be concentrated largely following 219, in 219, 220, and 221, with the aim of completing the procurement uh, project by the end of 221. That is the aim. So the mass majority <coughs> of the 600 million will be spread across those three financial years. Thank you for clarifying. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Um, Minister, I think your, your time is now upon you, and the first question is John Finney. Uh, uh, Minister, it's about active travel, and um, it's about words, and words are very important, even on budget sheets. So, The programme for government was very clear. It talked about doubling the investment in walking and cycling to £80 million, and that was very welcome. Cabinet Secretary's budget statement referred to active and sustainable travel. Um, now, can you clarify if there's any difference to be read into that, or what other modes of transport are, uh, are going to be covered by that 80 million, and how the funds will be distributed, please. Yes, uh, thank you. I, I, can, I had some social media um, uh, contributions from uh, active travel stakeholders on this, and I think there maybe is some confusion, so I welcome the member's question to be able to, to clarify. It's probably worth separating active travel and sustainable travel, so I can talk about them individually. Active travel is what he and I would generally call cycling and walking. Uh, sustainable travel generally is those things that makes our travel more sustainable without necessarily being active travel. The most obvious example would be for, for talking sake, uh, electric vehicles and, 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 and the funding for electric vehicles. So on the active travel side, I'm uh, just looking at the, the tables, uh, just as he was speaking, uh, they're generally funded from uh, a number of, from the active travel side, funded from uh, a number of different uh, funds uh, in the budget. Uh, support for sustainable and active travel is the, the big part of that. But if he looks at uh, the budget also, he'll see cycling, walking and safer streets uh, budget uh, as well. And then there's the future transport fund uh, as well. So the 80 million absolutely will be for active travel. So for a point of clarification, the 80 million, the additional spend, the additional... No charging points in the 80 million? Will be for... No, no, no. That will be in the sustainable... Uh, travel, and that will largely come out of uh, the future uh, transport fund, which has seen a more than 100% uh, increase uh, as well. So I hope that gives uh, an element of, of, of clarification uh, on that point. Uh, and the, the method of distrib distributing that money, Minister, are you able to...? I can give you some. Uh, I mean, clearly we're, we're working with stakeholders around the best way to... To, to distribute those funds, uh, you know, we've had the, the uh, now I have to say infamous uh, Mike Rumble's amendment uh, around, uh, uh, of course, increasing uh, training rates for, for children. I think it's a, a one that we welcome, of course, and voted for. So we're taking all of that into account. Uh, it would be fair to say, though, to answer the member's question, that a large proportion of that will be on capital, so segregated cycling infrastructure, footpaths, 
uh, and so on uh, and so forth. Uh, we'll also continue to use some of the existing uh, mechanisms that we have, so community links, community links plus, which are 50% uh, match funded uh, with, with local authorities, uh, as well as uh, some of the other uh, funds that we have, the mechanisms that we have, but we'll clearly give uh, more detail in due course. Okay, thank you very much. I'd move on to rail questions, if I may. Um, thank you, Convener. A couple of questions on rail, if I may. Minister, please. And the draft budget shows a significant shift in funding from rail franchise payments to rail infrastructure payments. Can you explain the reasons for this change and any implications this has uh, for future rail service provision, please? Yes, I mean, uh, I mean uh, we obviously uh, were very alert that that might come up as a question because it's a very distinct and very, uh, you know, very obvious uh, uh, difference. And, and the reason for that, really, the, the, the mo most of that change comes from fixed track access charges. So, again, the member may, may, may already be aware, but it's worth putting in the record, that fixed track access charges <coughs> essentially are determined by the ORR. So, over a control period, uh, they will look at uh, network rails income uh, and other revenue streams, uh, and then they will determine what the fixed track access charge will be. That has generally come, if it's come from the franchise, so, uh, again, fixed track access charges are complicated, but... Um, if they come from the franchise, they come in as from, from resource. If they're paid directly to Network Rail, they come in as capital. Uh, now, that can be difficult because fixed track access charges can vary year on year, and therefore there's variability in the resource and capital budgets. So in order to try to remove some of that instability or inconsistency, essentially all we're doing is paying those fixed track access charges from capital uh, as opposed to resource. So there's some consistency, there's less variability year on year, to answer the member's question, will it have any effect on real provision? The answer would be no, because you're still paying those fixed tracks actually charge. Whether you're paying them from resource or capital, you know, essentially you're paying them to network rail uh, for, the, for, for, for future rail provision. So I'll just we'll check that with officials, but that would be uh, the, uh, it's technical more than anything else. But uh, the, the answer to the question would be no, it wouldn't uh, affect uh, uh, real, real provision. OK, uh, thank you, Minister. You mentioned Network Rail, and the, the draft budget highlights significant changes to the funding and accounting of Network Rail projects uh, that will come into effect 2019-20. Uh, what impact might this have on future financing of Scottish Rail projects and the role of Scottish ministers in financing Network Rail operations in Scotland? I mean, the member will probably be aware that we've been in um, you know, quite robust discussions with the UK Government and Her Majesty's Treasury. Uh, around the funding for control period uh, 6, 2019 to 2024, and I know uh, he has commented on this, which I, which I thank him for. So the, there's, there's a couple of elements to that discussion. One is the level of funding, which is a disagreement, and that's been well versed, and, and I won't go into that to, other than to put on record once again how disappointed we are at, at the level of that cut, but that discussion is ongoing. So I parked that to one side. Uh, the other side of it is, is around uh, how that funding will be distributed. So again, he'll be aware that in previous control periods, uh, network rails have uh, been funded through its uh, borrowing capacity. Um, that's being shifted to, to, to grant funding, so we then will have uh, a direct control over the release of those funds. And that's something I've welcomed, having more flexibility uh, in, in that funding, uh, I think, is, is very helpful. Um, that will then put, the, you know, put in place, uh, arrangements will have to be put in place uh, to manage this change, and that has to be very much in line with uh, uh, the public finance manual, uh, assure that there's appropriate accountability and governance uh, by Network Rail and of Network Rail. Uh, and as I say, that uh, how much that uh, funding is, what level that funding is, is still a matter of discussion. But yes, there's a difference between the, the, the borrowing capacity, uh, which, was the, which was how uh, Network Rail uh, were originally funded, and now that's being replaced by grant funding. So there's some benefits to that, but uh, also, as I say, still a disagreement around the level of that fund. Thank funding. you. Uh, and with regard to the specific difference in the anticipated level of funding, are you able to say what potential implications that could have? Is there something that was going to happen that, as things stand at the moment, and hopefully they can be resolved, um, won't go ahead? Is the, because often well, that can focus minds if you can say, we were going to do this, we're no longer able to. Uh, well, we have, uh, we have a flexible pipeline approach to control period six, which means we don't have a prescriptive list of things that we'll do. However, there's some things that we absolutely have to do in control period six. Um, <coughs> for example, uh, the East Coast Main Line needs some uh, considerable investments already very much at capacity. Now, part of that was the stations at East Linton and Reston. And we've committed to, to bringing them forward in control period six. Uh, we absolutely uh, are determined to do that. But does that make the job more challenging? You know, if you have a £600 million cut already, 
cut, uh, then of course it does so. Uh, every single project in Control Period 6 that we have determined that we will be doing or that is in the pipeline, uh, of course all of those are potentially under threat and that's a very, very dangerous position uh, to be in. Now I've given as much reassurance to members as I can who have an interest in stations or uh, particular lines and I'll continue to give that reassurance but you know, I, I can't uh, magic money out of thin air if £600 million has been taken out of what the industry tells us they need for maintenance, operations, renewals, enhancements then clearly that's going to have an impact. 600 million, you know, you can't just absorb that without any impact at all. Okay, thank you very much, Minister. John, uh, there's a brief question from Rich Love. Yeah, um, the concessionary fares and, and bus services, there was a lot of misinformation during the last year about going to be caught, I'm going to lose my ticket. Um, can you give us a, an assurance, and I know the, the budget actually is back up, can you confirm that? And at the start of the meeting, it was said that uh, the budget in the Iraqi is down. Is it not the case because it's mainly down that motorways and trunk budget uh, line from 96 million to 819 million, a fall of 147 million, because Queen's Ferry Crossing has been completed, Aberdeen Western Periphery Route has been com nearly completed, and can, can Craig and Dalradi section of the A9 Dueling project has, has been completed. Is that not why the Iraqi committee budget has fell? Because of realignment? Yeah, uh, to, uh, to answer this, this last question first, uh, yes, you'd be right. Uh, that is part of the reason uh, of why the budget line has fallen, because projects get complete. You obviously don't have to spend so much on <coughs> crossing or uh, AWPR as it uh, gets to the end uh, of its uh, uh, life. In terms of his an uh, question around concessionary travel, he'll be aware there's a consultation uh, that was ongoing that closed uh, recently. A, a number of responses, really, very well responded consultation. Uh, that it was, and we're analysing that. But he's absolutely right to say that um, he'll have seen an increase in the, the, the budget uh, towards buses. Now, that makes up concessionary travel, it makes up the BESOG grant, and also makes up, uh, as was mentioned by the Cabinet Secretary in his opening statement, additional money to help green the fleet, uh, to help to meet our low so emission targets. good news for everybody. Targets. Good news, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, for everyone, and particularly just on his point, that if you have a concessionary card, you will absolutely be keeping that concessionary card. No ifs, no buts. I, may, I maybe should uh, no maybe. say that I do actually have one, so which I very seldom use. I, I wasn't going to suggest that you should register an interest in that particular question, but I'm pleased that you've clarified nonetheless. I think we'll leave that uh, bus pass there, as it were. John, um, you, you've got a question now. Thanks, convener. Um, Prestwick Airport, I wanted to ask about, I mean, there has been some speculation that uh, it might be getting near a sale, um, and I just wondered if you could give us any update or if we're going to continue having to meet their losses out of our budget. I can't give an update for, uh, you know, it's my colleague Keith Brown who, who leads on that, but at the last time I was asked this question, I mentioned that, uh, you know, those discussions uh, are very much uh, ongoing. Um, you know, we recognise, uh, of course, that Prestwick is a, is a non-typical uh, airport. Um, we're continuing to look at all business opportunities that there are. How do we maximise the assets that exist? Uh, but it's also very much been the government's intention, straight from uh, when we took over uh, Prestwick Airport, to, to ensure that uh, we were able to, to pass it on back into, into private hands, and uh, we're working on that. So, um, you know, there, there, there's a senior management team at the airport which has been tasked to take that forward, so I'm sorry, I don't have uh, an update necessarily. I could ask uh, my colleague uh, Keith Brown, uh, who leads on this on the Presbyterian Airport side, uh, for further information. Or the committee could ask, obviously, for further information. Uh, well, I mean, if, if, if there is any inf information you could give us in writing, or he could give us in writing through yourself or whatever, that would be uh, great. I'm sure appreciated. I mean, if I could just ask then, the the I, think, I understand the retained losses are now 26.5 million in the last accounts. Um, are we still expecting the purchaser? Uh, eventually to pay us back that 26 or whatever the cumulative losses are or will that would that be written off because that does affect the budget of course it does affect the budget but you know he's absolutely right we'd want to try to get the best deal possible for the taxpayer and therefore writing off the losses would be the preferred uh, uh, way forward but clearly of course if we're entering into a commercial negotiation with a private sector uh, company we'll need to have the space to have that discussion uh, and no doubt they'll be uh, toing and, and, and froing, but yes, it would be the preferred preferred position of, of the government without a shadow of a doubt, uh, it would be. But uh, again, uh, I can maybe perhaps uh, ask my colleague to provide more information, or my officials to provide more information uh, on Prestwick Airport. Okay, thank you. 
Just clarify just on that as well. I think what would be helpful from the committee's point of view is when you're answering that question to see what monies have been put aside for investment in Presswick Airport during the forthcoming year from the current budget. My, my always concern is with Presswick Airport is that on the uh, accounts for Presswick Airport, there's an open valuation and a closing valuation, and the closing valuation doesn't reflect the investment in the airport during the course of the year. So maybe if that could be clarified from a, an accountancy point of view, I think John uh, would appreciate that in the committee. Can I move on to the next question, if I may, uh, which is Jamie Green. Thank you, convener. <clears throat> um, can I uh, move on to ferries briefly? Um, can the minister explain why loans to CMAL have increased 400% to £59 million? Uh, the loans to CMAL, the large part of the increases, because he may be aware that we're in negotiations with RBS, who own uh, three vessels that operate on the North Link uh, route. So in order to spend to save, as it was over the term of the lease, uh, we're in entering negotiations to buy and purchase um, those three vessels. As I say, that is a spend to save measure. It will save us money uh, over uh, what would be the leasing uh, period. So the vast majority of that um, loan to CMAL is for that. There's also some money in there uh, which is about future vessel procurement as well as, it, as, as he'd expect. Um, but as I say, the vast majority of that, I couldn't give in to the exact figure because those negotiations are live with RBS as we speak. And again, they're subject of to and fro negotiations uh, at the moment. But uh, the majority, uh, very much of that money is, the vast majority of that money is uh, for the procurement, uh, sorry, the purchase of uh, the three RBS vessels. I see. Um, on, on ferries, um, can the Minister explain why a decision was taken um, in the budget uh, not to include any funding for Orkney and Shetland internal ferries, um, therefore not meeting the commitment of his colleague, Mr Keith Brown, uh, on the fair funding settlement for ferries in that part of the world, notwithstanding the uh, situation with local authorities. So the, there's two things that I would correct in his statement. One, uh, it wasn't Keith Brown that made the statement. Derek Mackay, he's talking about when it comes to fair, fair funding. But secondly, uh, the commitment was to enter into constructive dialogue uh, and to continue dialogue on fair funding for ferries. There was never, ever, in any documentation, and I would challenge the member if he wants to present it right here, right now, to ever automatically assume responsibility for internal ferries, which continue to be the responsibility of Orkney Island Council uh, and Shetland uh, Island Council. So that has always been the commitment. The commitment has been to enter into constructive dialogue. Now, in the last meeting that myself, Derek Mackay, and the leaders of Orkney and Shetland sat in, uh, it was then the leaders of Orkney and Shetland who went to the local press to say that those meetings were incredibly constructive. In fact, the uh, leader of Shetland Island Council, I paraphrase slightly and only slightly, he said it was the most optimistic he's ever been on this issue. Now, of course, uh, I understand they'll be disappointed that uh, it's, there's no inclusion for internal ferry services within the budget. But what I would say is for those that care so passionately about this issue, um, that there is a window of opportunity. And uh, I wonder whether the member himself would vote for a budget that would have additional resource uh, or indeed capital for internal ferries for Orkney and Shetland. Uh, further, I think Mike wants a follow up to that and, uh, and Mike. Can I just be absolutely clear in that case? Because what you're saying is, because I spent the time, uh, when the motion that was passed on the 6th of December said quite unanimously, the calls on the Scottish Government to set out to Parliament how it intends to honour its commitment in relation to Orkney and Shetland internal ferry services. So I went, spent some time going through the budget, and obviously it was a waste of time because you've just confirmed to my colleague Jamie Green that there isn't anything in this budget for internal ferry services for Orkney and Shetland. So really there is nothing in the budget whatsoever for that. Can I just confirm the, uh, what you've just yes, said? Yes, I can clarify. That there's no budget provision for internal ferries for Orkney and Shetland, which of course remains the responsibility for Orkney and Shetland. However, there is a window of opportunity, and again I would ask the member the same question. If that money is in the final budget in February, will he and his members support that budget? Well, Minister, to be fair, we are asking you the questions, and the sure. question I'm asking you... You can refuse to answer the question, the question but... The question I, uh, I'm asking you... 
I think, I think in fairness, rather than uh, the witnesses coming here or asking the committee questions, I think, uh, Minister, could you have a go at answering could, that question? Could I just, could I, just I, I already I answered the question. I well, said there's I, no could budgetary Could I privilege. ask a follow-up question, which is basically is, what does the Minister consider that Parliament voted for unanimously on the 6th of December? The budget is not for this? The, the, the motion is the there The motion for that Liam MacArthur put down? Sorry? The motion on the 6th of December that Liam MacArthur put down, which was voted on unanimously. And we, we also... You, the we question also I'm asking you now is because it's rather a fundamental point. I think everybody else was considering that this was a commitment by the Scottish Government to lay out its plans for the internal ferries. What you're saying now is you don't, you don't intend to do that. Uh, no, I, I think the motion... Right. Any... Sorry, sorry, hold on. There's, there's a lot of uh, chat coming around the room. Could I ask if we try and limit this, just so I can hear uh, the Minister's answer? Minister, sorry. Sure. The motion is on the record for people to see, and we actually supported, of course, okay. uh, the motion uh, as well. So we are now, uh, as, the, as the Parliament has asked, uh, the Minister, myself, and indeed the Cabinet Secretary, to lay out how we all meet the fair funding principle. Now, that is a commitment to the dialogue of fair funding. That is set out and has a number of principles, which include, for example, getting the true value and the true cost uh, of uh, ferry services. That is something that we're committed to doing. That constructive dialogue is something we're absolutely committed to doing and is ongoing. And the leaders of the council have said that that is going well. Now, what I would say is never has there been a commitment to automatically assume responsibility. And neither has either a council approached us to automatically assume responsibility of uh, their ferry services. So that would, be, uh, that would be my interpretation of the motion that was passed. And my, I'm, I'm sorry, but I don't think you're going to get more of an answer. I want to go back to Jamie Green, and then I'm going to come to Richard Lyle. Thank you, Convener. Um, without labouring the, the motions historic that were passed, isn't this primarily, though, around funding for ferries? Um, and the problem is that the councils have issued a statement saying that they simply don't have enough money to operate those services. Now, given that both of those councils had their budget cut in the budget, or in the proposed budget, so how does that marry up with fair funding? Well, it's not true uh, that they have. Uh, he, you know, local government has been treated well out of the draft budget. On top of that, of course, uh, Orkney and Shetland would both receive special islands need allowance on top of what they receive in terms of local government block grant. Uh, what I would continue to say to the member is that they are not the only local authorities that continue to pay for internal ferry services. There's a number of other local authorities uh, that also pay for internal ferry services as well. Now, I'm more than happy to continue the dialogue with both James Stockton from Orkney and Cecil Smith uh, leader of Shetland Island Council will do that constructively. But what I would continue to say to the member is there is a window of opportunity between the draft budget and the finalising of the budget. And that is, uh, you know, if that money is put in the budget, will members vote for it? And neither member that I've asked the question to thus far has said that they would. That question uh, is the next question, actually, is Richard's. Um, no, basically, I um, see that the, the, the funding, there is a, a window not of opportunity of, for people to come along to you and sit, and, and, and I think you're given that commitment, that people can sit down with you, uh, and you're given that firm commitment. If people come and chap your door, you always tell us your door's always open, they come and chap your door for additional funding for this ferry, uh, which I, I believe are quite high, quality ferries, uh, that you would uh, look at that and if people give that commitment, you would possibly be able to sustain that money. Ultimately, a decision would be for the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, but you know, he said and has said very clearly that uh, you know, if members want to engage positively and constructively on this issue, uh, if they will vote for the budget, uh, if they come to and put this on the table, then he will certainly consider that. Now, he's not ruled that out. I think that's an open invitation for members to then construct, uh, constructively engage with Derek Mackay on this issue, um, but they haven't done so far. Nobody has said yet that they would vote for a budget that had internal ferry serving, uh, funding uh, to it. So, you know, there is still a window of opportunity, and I hope uh, members will seize it. 
Thank you very much. And that neatly brings us to uh, the end of the questions. Can I say, Cabinet Secretary and Minister, there are a number of questions that have come out of today's meeting which will need to be dealt with very promptly in order to allow the committee to consider the report. Can I also say that the clerks will be contacting your offices verbally today and in writing very shortly thereafter to confirm the list of questions. And could I implore you please to make sure that they're responded to over the recess period so that we can work on the report that the Parliament has, the timetable for the report that the Parliament has set us. I'd like to thank the witnesses and their uh, assistance for, for giving evidence today. And I'd now like to suspend the meeting briefly to allow the witnesses to, to part. Thank you. I'd like to reconvene the meeting and move to item three on the agenda, which is subordinate legislation. This is the consideration of a negative instrument concerning the fishing and landing of razor clams. Rhoda Grant and myself uh, have asked the Scottish Government for further information, which has been provided and indeed published. The separately, the Scottish Government has also provided further information on the late related scientific trial. No motions to annul have been received in relation to this instrument, but I believe that Mr Finney would, would like to make a comment. Um, yeah, th thank you, Convener. Yes, uh, um, consistent with the position of the Scottish Green Party in April this year, where we were critical of the Scottish Government's decision to launch a trial of electrofishing for razor camps, we don't support this, but you're right to say that, that, that uh, we won't be... We can do the arithmetic and we won't be taking the issue further. Um, Concerns about this method um, it can leave other marine life vulnerable to predators um, and it won't allow, uh, whilst, you know, trudging causes difficulty, so does this mode. And I think um, I've certainly alert to the comments made that um, the, the measures that the government introduced um, to uh, limit this incident unlicensed activity have had limited success, I quote from the, the document here, because enforcement is very difficult and the vessels need to be caught with gear deployed. So I'm grateful for you giving me the opportunity to put that on the record. Thank you. In light of what uh, John Finney said, and I, I would also make the comment that uh, on the information that the government's provided, that this very much is a pilot project. And therefore, can I make the recommendation that on this uh, uh, SSI, that we don't make any comments on it, but would write separately to the Cabinet Secretary to ask the Cabinet Secretary uh, to give us further information on the matter and report back to the committee when the trial has been completed after the first year anyway, and then possibly after the second year to look back to see on the results to work out whether this instrument was indeed the way to go forward. So that would be my recommendation, and I would hope that... Uh, committee would agree with me and if you would agree with me I would put the question to you is the committee agreed that we don't want to make a recommendation but we would write to the cabinet secretary okay so that's agreed so the committee will now move into private sessions so I'm now going to close the meeting thank you <laughs>